the way in which we're presenting in the world and the right path or the right way to do things or the right way of being and allowing yourself to step outside the box or be unique or creative or, you know, figuring out a different way that's going to work for you and not letting any of that kind of pull you down or stop you from progressing. Yeah. And- Welcome to the Her First Podcast, a platform to help online business owners, coaches, and creators gain the confidence needed to build a successful business while creating a sustainable lifestyle balance. We are here to help you prioritize yourself in business and life. I'm Joanna Newton. And I'm Michelle Poulani. In this podcast, along with the Her First Collective, you can engage in the challenges women face in business, ways to increase your impact or income online, and how to make it all work while launching, scaling, or maintaining. Spoiler, it's not about perfectionism, hustling, or a copy-paste methodology. Let's dive in. The other day, I had a really interesting conversation with my daughter about Kamala Harris's run for president. Now, she's only seven years old. She lives in a household where her mother works full-time, is the primary breadwinner of her family, and honestly has no idea that the rest of the world might not work that way. And I realized when I was telling her about her run for president that my daughter didn't know that we've never had a female president before in the history of the United States of America. And when I shared this fact with her, she was shocked. She said, what? That's not fair. It should be equal. The sweetest, most innocent response from a little girl who has not yet been affected negatively by the patriarchy, at least that much so far. And it got me thinking about the way we talk about women in politics and women in leadership and how that affects how young women, other women, other men see the possibilities for women in leadership. And if you've paid any attention to the news lately, there has been so much rhetoric about why Kamala Harris is not a good choice for president of the United States of America. There's a lot of things that go outside of policy qualifications, her history in politics that people are bringing up and talking about that seem to me that are they are likely happening just because she is a woman. And we're judging in this case a female candidate and a male candidate very, very differently. So today, what we're going to do is talk about some examples of what people are saying about her in the news and discuss how that affects the people around us and how we view women in leadership. Her First is all about prioritizing yourself in your business and in your life. And we talk a lot on this podcast about the issues predominantly that women face in the world when they try to do that. And so this topic today gets to the root of that because it's not always a choice for us. It's not always a no-brainer. It's not always the thing that we're just able to do and stand up for because there are cultural implications, because there are political implications, because there are work and societal things that have kept us in this place. There is a level of oppression that occurs with gender. And so we've talked a little bit about how women have struggled in the workplace how women have struggled financially because of our history, because of our culture, because of the way in which things are governed and have been run. And that does come down to politics. And we're not leaning any particular way with this conversation today. We're just bringing this conversation to light. The point of which we're making through this conversation is that this type of argument is about attacking the person for who they are, independent of what their policies are, independent of how they show up, independent of their qualifications, like Joanna was mentioning. And that's difficult. Now, it's something that you as an individual have to consider when you face similar challenges, when you have these difficulties presented in front of you. And it may not feel fair. It may not feel correct. It may not feel ethical but we still have to navigate them and we have to understand them and be aware of them to make sure that we're not hindering ourselves and that we're not letting other people hinder our progress, our success based on these assumptions. So that's a lot of what this conversation is today and just kind of 
looking at these examples and then seeing how they show up in your life, seeing how they show up in your business, seeing how they show up in your work and figuring out how you can navigate around them, overcome them or move forward and past them. Yeah. And we're going to dive right in talking about the reasons why people say a woman can't be president. And as we're talking exactly as Michelle said, these are themes that you likely have experienced in your life as a woman or may have seen, you know, in your life as a woman. And the first reason I'm going to bring up is that people will say that a woman can't be president because she can't get the respect of other countries. So this comes a lot of times when it comes with like the military, like a woman couldn't be a military leader or a woman couldn't be that strong person that's going to keep another country from attacking us or hurting us, that she can't work globally because she can't get that respect. This was one of the things that really inspired this conversation with for me because a friend of mine actually had a family member say this on Facebook. So a friend of mine who is amazing in her career, an amazing woman, an amazing mom, she had a family member say this, a very close family member talking about how Kamala can't be president because she cannot get the respect of other countries. And this is what really got me thinking is because there are women in your life that listen to you. There are younger girls that are listening to this. And if we have this rhetoric, this conversation where we are constantly saying women can't get the respect, women don't have that way of getting respect from other world leaders, we're really just downgrading and and putting the ceiling on what women can achieve. And there's really no, at the end of the day, scientific basis or real things to back it up to say they can't get respect. But if we start actually respecting women and we start saying, yes, they can do this, they're going to be in a position where they can. They're going to be in a position where world leaders will respect them if they have the respect of the people around them. And I think this kind of conversation is maybe even seem well-intended or not super malicious, but it really has a negative effect on how we view women and how people who hear that view women. It's also just a fallacy. If we haven't had a female president before, how do we know that we won't be able to command the respect of other countries with one in place? Like they're just making assumptions based on their belief system and the way in which they've engaged with the world and how they see women or how women in leadership have been demonstrated to them before. And you can't always necessarily blame them for the way that they think because we have been taught this. This is environmental. This is circumstantial. This is in a home environment. This is in a school environment. This is in a corporate environment. This is in a political environment in which has cultivated that belief system. But you do have to question it and they can start to question it for themselves, have that awareness and then make changes ideally. Also, there are female leaders in other countries. So the idea of it in the first place is just silly and seems like a difficult thing to wrap your mind around when you have a different perspective, but it is able to be argued because it's just a fallacious statement. Like, actually, I don't know if that means <laughs> penis or like rock. I no. like both. I think I think both. <laughs> no, keep it. Out. Keep <laughs> it. Okay. Let's focus. Wow, Michelle. Penis and wrong. I mean, okay. come on. Okay. So it's something that can be easily debated based on the evidence, right? Like put a female president in place. And then also, like just because she's a woman, not being able to command respect is just, again, it's somewhat silly and it's somewhat frustrating because there are women in leadership who already do that. There are women in the military who already do that and it's been demonstrated. And so if you look at those examples and those experiences, it's like, just because she's a woman doesn't mean that she's not going to command respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Aretha Franklin, it's the demand and the command of it. And I think the more that we bolster and empower women, we individually can command that respect. And that is, I think, demonstrated and proven. And now I'm just babbling. But like, realistically, this is a statement that is made off of an incorrect belief system that they've woven for themselves and isn't based on evidence or facts at all. For the people who believe that rhetoric, right, like a woman cannot gain the respect of other world leaders, that that is not something that is possible. 
they put this self-fulfilling prophecy in their head. They believe it and then they will see that to be true because they will not necessarily even look at the facts. That's just what will happen for them in their brain. Like our brains are so, so powerful. And when we say women are worse at certain things or women can't do certain things, we kind of just create this self-fulfilling prophecy of that to be true. This is not quite the same level, but I think typically people think that men are better at sales. Like I think that's like a like a common thing people will say. That's something like I've believed myself about myself. Like I'm not good at sales. I have we have two salespeople at my company, a man and a woman. If I do the math on the sales we bring in, our close rates, all of that, I am just as good of a salesperson on paper. But in my head, I think that I'm a worse salesperson. And I would say most people would probably look into my company and assume just off the bat, they would think that's the salesperson when looking at Brandon. I think there is that like, what's the word, prejudice against like women in sales. But on paper, some months I sell more, some months he sells more. Like we're neck and neck in terms of our sales abilities. And I've even believed it about myself that that's not what I'm good at when actually I am. Like it's on paper, I am good at that. But when we kind of frame what women are good at and what men are good at outside of facts, it can really affect how we see things. Yeah, there's a huge bias around it. And I won't deny that we have natural propensities within the genders. Like we've talked about that before on the podcast. And I do think that we lean certain ways. That's a whole other discussion. But when it comes to the way in which you function in your business, you may be operating off of mistaken belief systems or ways in which you've been taught or things that have been ingrained into you that you are not good on camera or that you aren't good with the financials in your business or that you can't do sales because you can't just cold outreach people. Or again, you're limiting yourself in this way, or I have to prove myself. Like we've talked about this on the podcast before of when applying for work, women will look to at least 90 to 100 percent of qualifications that the job is listed for, where men look for what 60 percent in terms of qualifications, and then they make up the rest or they know that they can learn the rest. And so there is a certain level of confidence and a certain level of belief in oneself that comes with those ingrained teachings and they've demonstrated in the classroom. If you look to a male and a female student and you, as the instructor, make it clear, whether through exact language or subconscious language, that the male student is going to be better at math and the female student will be better at writing, they will develop that way. And so it's so important to pay attention and question what are the belief systems that you currently have? What information are you listening to and how do you see yourself in your business and in your work that might be inhibiting you and how can you start to change and shift that our minds the language we use the how we talk about things just play such a huge role in in what we do and believe and outcomes and i think that's why this is so important and this conversation is really important another reason people are saying that a woman can be president or a woman shouldn't be president, is because of this belief that something is wrong with a man who votes for a woman. This is a conversation that people are having. And recently, um, there was a discussion on Fox News about why a man would join a Zoom call supporting Kamala Harris's run for president. And I'm sure you've seen there's all these Zoom calls, people are raising money, people are doing things gathering. And there was a group of men who gathered together to support and raise money for her presidential. Fox News consultant Jesse Waters said to be a man and then vote for a woman just because she's a woman is either childish, that person has mommy issues, or they're trying to be accepted by other women. That's what he said. So he basically kind of called out men who are going to vote for a woman for president. And I think that sort of rhetoric that there's something wrong with you as a man if you vote for a woman is is honestly really sad. Women have voted for men for our entire history. We've had one opportunity to vote for a woman for president all of our years as the United States States of America. So we've voted for men. That doesn't make us less of a woman. 
or have daddy issues, right? Like this is quite the claim to say. And to say that basically men are are exposing themselves in a bad way if they're choosing to support her is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And just looking at the quote in and of itself is you're talking about voting for someone just based on their gender, just because she's a woman. So, you know, if we look at that, I understand where he's coming from or what his thinking is because he's isolating it to just the gender and not looking at the other details. And so voting positively for a woman. But I think it's very incorrect, right? Men can be feminists and they might vote for a woman because they really truly believe that a woman, independent of who that woman is, will actually be better in leadership because it's demonstrated that female founders from a business perspective in leadership actually retain higher profit margins, grow and scale the company better, and are generally more successful than their male counterparts. In leadership roles, in politics, in government, we've seen the, obviously this is just general statements that we're making here, and none of it is like applies to everyone because there are always situations that are outside of what we're generally talking about. But in politics and government, it's also been demonstrated that women are incredibly successful in their roles. They think more judiciously. They think more big picture. They keep things a little bit more, I think, calm and collected, which is funny because there's this common narrative that women are overly emotional or that they get, you know, governed by their emotions and that they could never be in leadership because of that, which is just, again, it's just silly when I see it, but I don't want to just say that that's the only thing. It's just not actually proven or demonstrated. Like there's no hard facts or evidence that says that that is the case. And again, women in leadership tend to be more ethically inclined. That's probably a subjective opinion, but I see that across the board. They think more critically. They have better problem-solving skills. Like They're able to approach things by thinking about a lot of different things where men tend to have a solo kind of like mono thought process where they kind of focus on one thing at a time. So I just don't think a lot of these are grounded in evidence or fact, and I think that there needs to be more of that. Now, when you think about how this applies to you, and this particular comment is that there's something with a, wrong with a man who votes for a woman and that it implicates these other things is, again, these people are making arguments based on their subjective opinions and their biases, the way in which they think. And if a man chooses to vote for a woman simply because she's a woman, it might be that I hire someone just because she's a woman or that I make choices based on gender because of the way in which I've engaged in the past. Or I choose to work with a coach because she better understands me because she's a woman. Or I choose a personal trainer or a massage therapist. Like I don't like getting massaged by men and I prefer getting massaged by women. So there are choices that we make based on gender, but it shouldn't implicate that we have underlying issues. And I think what this person is trying to do is essentially target men and saying that you can't vote for this person solely based on gender because you have these issues related to it. I don't even know how to relate this to yourself in your business and in your life, but I don't know. How would you relate this, Joanna, back to like, to you know, like our, our deeper conversation of prioritizing Yeah, I mean, yourself? I think for, for us, honestly, realizing that there are men out there who are going to take issue to being led by you because they're a woman, because you are a woman. That's the reality that you as a female leader and an entrepreneur should be aware of that you're facing. And not to say, like, I don't play a victim, right? Like, I this is not to say, oh, woe is me. I can't achieve this thing because that person won't let me. Like, scratch that out of your vocabulary. But being aware that your leadership is going to be questioned, looked at, maybe harder to achieve as a woman than it is as a man teaches you that you might have to go about it differently to win, right? Like you might have to. And I, you know, this is really evident in the corporate world, I think. And I worked really hard in the corporate world to not be seen as like a woman. And I know that sounds really, really weird, but women in the corporate world, there's like a, that feels like there's a ceiling for you. There's an ex, there's a different expectation of, of to how you're expected to work, how you're expected to include people, how you're expected to take on all of these extra tasks. 
And for me, in order to be seen as like an executive strategic leader in a company, I had to make very active decisions to like not do those women tendencies I have. To speak to whether that's like learned or ingrained, I think that that's like way beyond my pay grade of something that I'm capable of discussing. But there are things women do, like accommodate people, include everybody, take the notes, plan the parties, be very kind, constantly remind people to do work. I think in the corporate world, you see women tend to be really good at like understanding these broad, big picture things. And men just tend to be like, I can do this task today. And and I see that. And I don't, I can't really speak to whether that's biological or learned. It feels learned because it feels from my experience that men and women have different expectations upon them. But the reality is, is you're facing more people than you think who think if I let a woman lead me, I'm less of a man. There are people who you meet that actively think that, know they think that and will say it out loud. And then there are people who you meet and work with that it's subconscious, where they think you cannot lead them because you're a woman. And this is just a reality of the world we live in. When I was sort of going viral, we've talked about this in other episodes, I was going viral talking about like women in leadership, women staying home, all of that. A lot of that misogyny came out and people came for my husband. People would say, oh, your wife must cheat on you because you're not a strong man, because she's strong. Like people said that, right? So there's the, there was this assumption about my husband who I barely talk about, right? Like in, in a lot of my, I talk about him, of course, in my life, but like in my content, you know, I talk about how he's a stay-at-home dad, how he's doing those things. People say, oh, well, your wife's going to cheat on you or your wife's definitely cheating on you because she is a strong woman. Like people say that and we've got to stop this record, this rhetoric when you think, Your children are listening, young people are listening, and the women in your lives are listening. And like you are saying that if you as a man go under the leadership of a woman, you are less than. It's a wild world we live in, and it's a surprise that those are common narratives that we see in our society today. And I think you brought it home with how does this apply to me and my business and in my work is knowing that there are these biases out there, knowing that you're going to face them and you know, decide how you endure through them. I think the beautiful thing that we're seeing with female founders and business owners, having more women rise to that expression is that they can start to embody more of themselves. Like I have really been into this recently of tapping into the feminine energy and tapping into like this pleasure sexual like aspect of being a woman and then exuding that. It's like, you know, oh, you can't be sexy in the workplace. Why not? Like, obviously, I don't want to show inappropriate things. But realistically, like if I wear a low cut top to my business and my work, that should not be an issue. And so I think obviously there are professional expectations that we hold in certain settings, but I'm really enjoying, especially as a content creator, especially as, you know, your own business owner and getting to decide how you show up is kind of letting go of needing to feel like what Joanna did in the corporate setting because that wasn't her business, that wasn't her environment, that was, you know, pushed upon her, is that we can start to embody some of that feminine energy or some of that like exude some of those things that other people deem as unprofessional or unacceptable or put us in the victim seat of how we're dressing and how we're being, which is a male construct in that way. Yeah, I think it's important for us to identify and acknowledge these things so that we can move through them, so that we can act accordingly, and we can set a different precedent. We can create a different narrative. Like That's what we're ultimately trying to do at a deeper level. That's the mission. That's the goal. Both of our companies, we want to run them differently. We want to treat workers differently. We want to create content differently. We want to create brands and products differently so that we change this discussion, so that we stop just believing and assuming that someone is weak if they 
vote for a woman or that they have mommy issues or that they want to see a woman in leadership simply because she's a woman. Considering the fact that we've had male uh, candidates and political leaders who shouldn't have any respect from other countries, like to get into that conversation of, you know, where we started is that they should not have any respect from the people that they lead, the coworkers that they have or other people in politics and other countries. That already happens for men. And that's because of their choices. It's not because they're a man. It's because they don't deserve respect in the first place because of their actions and their choices. And so why would you disrespect a woman simply because of her gender when she hasn't demonstrated any of the things that her male counterparts have and the way in which they've abused their power or abused their position? And I love what you shared about being able to build a world where you could lean into your feminine energy, where you can have have that energy and be strong. And this is where language, language and rhetoric and the stories we tell each other are so important because think about the use of a pussy as an insult to men. You call a man a pussy, it means he's weak, incapable, right? Like that is that is an insult we all say. We think that a pussy is weak. A woman's vagina is not weak. It's one of the most like resilient body parts that we have. We literally create the next generations from them, right? Like like there's also all men by the way, all men have come through a vagina. Well, well, uh, yeah. actually obviously barring C-sections, but realistically yeah. like you know, that's they've been we, pushed through. We push the children out. We create the next generation. We create the the legacy of our world. And that that body part adapts and repairs. So that is not weak, but we take that as weakness because of the rhetoric and the way we talk about it. When the fact is, it's freaking beautiful. And like our society would not survive if women was le- were like, no, we're not doing this anymore. We would be done. We actually have all of, at the end of the day, we actually are the ones with all of the power. When you think of like humanity, and, and I know we're talking about the presidential race, but like literally humanity is in our hands and we can control that. And I think that actually scares people. And I think that creates this rhetoric that we're weak that we need a man, that we need all of those things, because we could change it all. If we're all just like, nope, never mind. We're done until this is fixed. Like, that would be an interesting strike. We're actually seeing nations who are struggling with their economies because of reproduction and and that be an issue of not having enough new babies in the world. Like, literally, it's a, it's an issue that they're seeing and the way in which they're encouraging their citizens to reproduce. And that does stand in the power of women. Like, obviously, males have a say in it or whether the, obviously. They have a role. They play a role. Obviously, men have a say in it, but they have a role. They play a role. But ultimately, like, we're the ones with all the power. And I think you're right. I think it's it's always coming from fear. It's always coming from this fear-based assumption that, if they do lose control or if they're not able to be in power, that women will take over and they won't like what happens. Um, so, yeah, I think that's yeah. a huge part of it. So the next reason we're going to talk about that, about why people say a woman couldn't be president is because the belief that a woman in power must have slept her way to the top. And believe it or not, this is a legitimate conversation that people are having about Kamala Harris. There was a discussion on Fox News where they were talking about Kamala Harris sleeping her way to the top. And I'll tell you, I tried to do some research to see if there was like any actual like hard evidence news stories that this was even remotely true. And I couldn't find anything. But they were implying that the way she got things done, the way she got certain positions was by doing sexual favors. This one conservative author called her the original Haktua girl. Literally, she, Kamala Harris is the vice president of our country right now, and he called her the original hug to a girl. Now, I, from what I can tell, there's no like people coming out against her stories, anything legitimate backing up 
her doing sexual favors for power. But the fact that we're even talking about it when there's really no hard evidence that I am aware of at this time that that's true is just really sad. Like, why are we defaming her and saying she did these things to get ahead? Like, why is that even part of the conversation that we're having to try to mar her character? It's just attacking the person. And this is one of the reasons why I actually don't tune in or pay attention to politics like at all. Like, I'm not a news person. And I know everyone's like, well, you should be informed about what's happening in the world. But not really. Like, it only negatively impacts my mindset and the way that I see things. And I'm in a place in my life of evolution and growth where I don't need to hear about any of that. Like, I'll pay attention when it makes sense or when it applies to things that we're doing. So many of these are just terrible arguments. I studied philosophy in college. And one of the things that we talk about are all the different types of arguments in which aren't actually good arguments. They don't actually talk about the topic of discussion in clarity with evidence, facts, or even like spoken opinions about the matter. It's just you're just attacking the person and you're making assumptions or trying to just like bring down the person and taint other people's perspective of that person. And, you know, I think this is actually really applicable to us when it comes to cancel culture is that in social media, as you grow your influence, as you grow your business, as you grow your following, there is the potential that you post something that people do not like and then then people will attack you like Joanna with her commentary and the vitriol that she was experiencing with people's comments is part of the same thing. Like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about because you use sex as a weapon. I'm like, wait, what? That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Or you don't know what you're talking about because you wear pantsuits. I'm like, wait, again, that has nothing to do with with what we're talking about. And that's exactly what's happening here is that her sex life should have absolutely nothing to do with her candidacy. And it's likely that these allegations are being pointed out with no basis. And I don't know. I guess I just like I just don't see this even being a thing. I don't have enough information to speak about the actual instance intelligently, but it's just silly to me. Like I can't I can't help it. But I just wish that people focused more on the qualifications and what someone's bringing to the table than the the personal lives that they're living. You know what I mean? And I think it's a a difficult thing to do at a large scale, but you as an individual, you as a business owner, knowing that some of that cancel culture, some of that languaging can come up and it depends on how you decide to respond to it that then takes you to that next level. You know, you can be accused of similar things and how do you handle them? How do you respond? And what sort of attention do you allow it and how does it affect you? Because I've heard so much. We just had that social media trend that was Oh my gosh, I'm going to forget the name of it. We talked about it on the podcast, but it was like real life social media. It's like, yeah, on social media, my life is this, but really I deal with this. And ultimately, it was a lot of doubt, insecurities, and fear that we each individually have and expressing those. And a lot of that also comes from negative comments that people receive or DMs or threats or these things that people are kind of throwing at you when you're putting yourself out there and feeling vulnerable on social media and you have to figure out how you're going to respond to it and how you're going to deal with it and how you're going to keep yourself safe and how you're going to protect your mental wellness in putting yourself out there as a content creator because we know that it's going to come. We know that there are trolls. We know that there are shitty people in the world who are going to try to make you feel bad or attack you, not based on merit, not based on what you're talking about, but just because you are the way that you are, whether that's skin color, whether that's hair, whether that's your gender identity, whether that's your sexual preference, all of these things that people are going to attack just because you are the way that you are. And it's not grounded in anything, but it can affect you. So being mindful of what that looks like for you on a day-to-day basis and make sure you're protecting yourself against that. Yeah. And in this case, like, you know, Kamala is being held to a different standard than male presidents we've had in the past. I mean, we have past presidents who have serious sexual abuse allegations against them, that they abused their power and used that for them to get sex, right? Like, they, I mean, there's impeachments over it, right? Like, there are serious things happening, and she's being held to a very different standard. And so when we're, we're looking at these, all of these issues, it's like, 
the standard that she's expected to have and the standard a man is expected to have are two different things. And then we're using that to argue she shouldn't be president when like Donald Trump has way, I think, way worse (laughs) allegations against him when you come to like the sexual world and sexual deviance, right? But we're looking at purity culture and kind of saying, like, it's not fine for him. Boys will be boys, but like not for her. Again, I don't even know if anything's actually true or substantiated or what has happened. But regardless, that's not the point. The point is they're being held to a very different standard. And one of the next things that it is wild that it's coming up is that there's a little literal discussion right now that women who aren't mothers can't possibly understand the needs of Americans. And J.D. Vance, the vice presidential candidate, he brought up this whole conversation talking about how the Democrats are run by childless childless cat ladies and, and talking about Kamala Harris and AOC and all of these people who have not birthed children and how therefore they can't have a stake in our community, in the future of America, because they don't get it. And one, that's horrible in and of itself. But Kamala Harris is a mother. She did not birth children, but she is a mother. So one, you're you're kind of saying you're not a mother because you didn't birth them, which, which is wild. That's not true. But then also making the claim that if you're not a mother, you're somehow a worse world leader. You're a worse executive. You you don't care about the country. Like we're just like jumping to this again personal attack plus some sort of claim that just makes no sense. Also, this cracks me up because they would also argue the complete opposite. A woman can't be president because she's a mother or she's pregnant or she's going to have to divide her attention in some other way, which a lot of presidents we've had have been fathers. And so how has that never been an argument before? I actually don't know if any presidents have not had kids, but I'm assuming yes, at the time that they were presidents, right? Let's fact check that. Someone look it up. But realistically, not being a mother is a choice. And there are a lot of childless women in this world who are leading perfectly fine lives and are able to care for other people, other family members, other aspects of what it is that they're doing. I think this one is an interesting discussion because I'm going to bring up a social media post. So there are a lot of women who celebrate motherhood. And this is an interesting discussion too. We have both sides of the coin. Joanna is a mother. I am not a mother. And The social media post was from a content creator who I've been following for years. She started in nutrition. She does courses. And now she does a course that specifically helps people, you know, create their own online course and then sell and market that on social media. I love the way that she does it. It's not MRR. It's not using somebody else's content. Like she creates all of her own stuff. So she made a post basically about the fact that, you know, all of the women around her or other friends or whoever are celebrating their second child and she's over here in Bali enjoying her smoothie bowl. And she got so much flack for it that was basically people coming out of the woodwork saying like, I can't believe you would hate on moms this way. I can't believe that you would tear down motherhood. Like this is not a good look. And I was, I looked back at the post. I'm like, nothing in this was saying anything bad about being a mother. It was celebrating her lifestyle choice to not have children. And although we look at motherhood and we say, oh my God, you're so amazing. Congratulations. You have a baby. You're pregnant. Let's host a baby shower and get all these gifts and do all these things. And I respect that culture and I take part in that culture. I have lots of friends who have children. I have family members who have children. Both my sisters have kids and I love and respect that. But also the choice to not have children children should be just as respected and just as enjoyed. And so it's okay for someone to celebrate the life that they've chosen that is away from children and it does not distract from their ability to care or it does not deter from their ability to care and empathize and make good decisions and be a strategic thinker. So I feel like with the choice of motherhood, nobody wins because as a leader, like you shared this on the podcast the other day about not being given an opportunity because you had just had a child. And that was an assumption that was made or that you can't show up, you can't do the amount of work. Oh, we can't have that expectation of you. We see that in the workplace all the time. 
when it comes to leadership. But then obviously, if you're not a mom, then you don't understand what it is to be nurturing. And that's just ridiculous. Wow, today is really making yeah, me really sorry. upset. This is my topic idea. And you, you, you normally ignore these things and I'm like shoving it in your face. But there's the reality. You know, something I've been thinking a lot about with this, with this election and where the government is right now, you know, we talk about what America was founded on. No taxation without representation, right? That means all types of people need to be represented in our government. So yes, a 30-year-old woman who's single with no kids, she needs to be represented. Represented? Why does that word just sound so funny? But you, you get what I'm saying. Like, all of the different kinds of people, religion, race, childless, with children, all of those types of people need to be represented in our government. And someone needs to understand their stake. It's not just a traditional family with a mom and a dad and 2.5 kids and a dog that needs representation. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I kind of am. And with just some of the rhetoric coming around the importance of mothers, if you have read Project 2025 and some of the things that go along with that, it's very much saying that we need to elevate the nuclear family, mother, working father, children. And there are people in our government that want to push that sort of agenda. And we look when we look at what happened with Roe v. Wade, when we look at what's happening with women's reproductive rights, when we look at some of these things that are happening, there are there are people who want like who are talking about family votes and people with a family getting votes for their children. Now, I'm not saying any of that's going to happen tomorrow. These are discussions people are having that are trying to say a family with a mom, working dad and children is the epitome of America. And so like there's like real things happening. That, that are brought on by this rhetoric that to be a valid woman in America, you need a husband and kids. And that's disgusting because it's, it's not true. It takes, you know, the adage, it takes a village. It takes all kinds to make this world work. And pardon the French, but I know a lot of nuclear families who are incredibly fucked up. Like, just because you have a mom, a dad, and two kids does not mean everything is peachy keen. Like, that shitstorm of experience can still happen in that environment. So it doesn't mean that it protects the children. It doesn't mean that it has good ethics. It doesn't mean that it's living in a healthy, positive way. There are all ways in which we choose to live our lives, and one is not better than the other. And you can argue the same point about a man who either doesn't have children or is just a father, maybe not even a present father, or the way in which they've chosen to lead their career or what they're capable of based on this same conversation. Yeah. <sighs> and, and the reality is when we, when we tell these stories, when we share these myths that certain people are better or have a bigger stake in our community if they've done certain things, it's just very harmful and very prejudiced and it can be very isolating for people. Like imagine you're a Republican and you are planning on voting for Donald Trump. And, you know, it's hard to imagine, but just like pretend for a second. The, and then the vice presidential candidate says, oh, we can't have childless cat ladies running this country. And you're a woman. Maybe you wanted to get married maybe to a man, and you wanted to have children, and maybe it didn't happen for you. Maybe you wanted that life, and you're sitting there and saying, like, what, I'm not valid now? Like, like my life is somehow not valid because this is what I ended up with? Like, I just think that's very sad. We... Yeah. And just on the topic of like pregnancy and birth and being able to actually have children is like I have a friend who just ended a three year trial and challenge of trying to conceive and they tried every way that they could possibly do it and they just failed again. And it's not always that person's choice not to have children. For So for you to judge someone based on their their lack of children is 
a huge assumption about their choices and their abilities or their issues that they've had or whatever the case is for that particular person, but it can also be really, really harmful. And we do have to consider like if you are a woman or if you are a man and you're in a heterosexual relationship and you love the husband and wife thing and you have two kids, that's great. That's beautiful. But it's not the only way. And I think what we're challenging here is again deciding for yourself like are you following narrative that you have fed into because you've made, been made to believe that it's the only way or it's the best way. If you're doing things in your business because someone told you that this is the best direction to go, but it's not aligned to who you are and your soul's purpose and like where you want to see yourself going, is it the right thing? It's like you have to question the way in which we're presenting in the world and the right path or the right way to do things or the right way of being and allowing yourself to step outside the box or be unique or creative or you know figuring out a different way that's going to work for you and not letting any of that kind of pull you down or stop you from progressing. Yeah, and when in our news we're looking at a presidential candidate who has some different qualities about her than other presidential candidates, right? She's a stepmom, she is a black and Indian woman. These are things we haven't seen in a presidential candidate before. And we're criticizing her character, her way of life, those things. That's very harmful. It's very harmful to say these things make you not a presidential candidate because there are, you know, gay children, there are women, there are people of all races, ethnicities, religions who need to be represented in our government, might have dreams of being represented in our government. And this rhetoric tells them no. And it tells the people around them no. And I don't think that's what the point of our country is, right? And and the point of being able to pursue the things that you want. And that's what we're about right here. We're about saying, hey, specifically for women, Go live the life you want, regardless of what anybody says. And so our language and what is said just play such a huge role in that. This is not our typical conversation. I mean, we do like to push the boundaries of what we talk about when it comes to the, the way in which our world is governed, the belief systems that we have, and the way in which we're operating and either hindered by or we're able to leverage. And so we have to think about these things because it's not just us operating in isolation. There's a whole community. There's a whole society. There's a whole government that is part of that conversation. And so we as individuals, as business owners, as women, and as people who have an idea of where we're headed, who have goals, who have a destination, who have bigger visions for what we want to see and what we want to have accomplished in this world, it's important to have these conversations. And so you know, it wasn't our typical conversation for the day, but I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's given you some things to mull over. And wherever you land on the political spectrum, I hope that you don't feed into the same fallacies or the same inappropriate arguments for whether someone should succeed or not, and then see how that applies to your life. We're giving examples at a very high scale, right? We're talking about the president of the United States of America. That's like top of the top here in our country. But we can boil these principles down to what it is that you're doing in your business on a day-to-day -day basis, how you actually engage with other people, the relationships that you have, and how you can step up to the plate with more empowerment, more power in yourself, more belief, more confidence to make decisions, to make choices, to show up, to create content, to develop products, to run your company and your business in the way that you see fit and not be torn down by these inappropriate fallacies or cancel culture or something that someone is going to throw at you because of who you are at your core and not letting that rattle you and being able to move beyond. So thank you so much for tuning in today and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Find the link in the show notes to join us in the Her First Collective, a free Facebook group to discuss the podcast, ask questions of our guest experts, and network with a group of female entrepreneurs who value collaboration over competition. Please subscribe, share, leave a review, and be sure to catch our next episode. What is one thing you can do today to prioritize you in business and life?